There we go. So now we're on. Now we're on record. So this is called an RS quad, and it was uh, developed by a guy by the name of Robin Sherbun, who was a longtime member of the Northern Lights Fly Tires in Edmonton, and, and I'm sure Florin will remember Roman. And Roman used to guide on the crow's nest. Uh, he was a teacher and he would spend his summer guiding down there. So he developed this mayfly pattern that uh, had four characteristics that might trigger a strike. And one was this trailing shuck for an emerger. Another was the ribbed body. And the third was the bulky thorax. And the fourth was the parachute wing. That's why he called it the RS quad. So we're going to start that one. Now the first bit of material, the first thing you need is a hook. And the first hook, I'm, I'm going to do this. You can tie them down to 18s without too much trouble. Uh, but I'm going to tie it on, on a size 10 so you can actually see what's going on. I've got one that's tied down to a 16 here. I'll show you later. Um, so as usual, I'm going to take the barb off the hook before I tie it. So if it breaks, I don't have to retie another fly. Um, get in the race good and snug. And I'm going to use on this particular color, I'm tying it like a pale morning dun. So it's a sort of a creamy color fly. And I'm going to use a, a base thread and, it, and it's small thread, it's an eight aught. This is primarily a parachute fly. So I'm going to start the thread at the eye of the hook. And I'm going to wrap the thread down the, the shank of the hook halfway. Dress the hook right down to the halfway point. And then I'm going to bring it back halfway between halfway and the eye. So basically a quarter way down the shank of the hook. And that's where I'm gonna put the wings. Now the wings for this is not going to be the easiest to find because what you need for this, the way he tied it, you could use Antron, uh, you could use other materials for the post for the wing. Um, but this is turkey flats, which will be reversed in your image. Um, and turkey flats come off the butt, butt part of the turkey. And the really good ones look like this. They, they're kind of square on the top, have a lot of fuzz on the bottom. And the feathers range, they come out in a, in a V shape off the turkey, off the stem. So what you do though, is you don't tie the whole thing in. We're only gonna tie segments in. And the first thing you need to do is snip out the little bit at the end here. Now, because these, these fibers get longer as you get further down the stem, to get that square top, you want to tie your smaller flies first and your bigger flies later. I've already tied a few small ones. So this is where I'm at after having tied a few flies. And so what I'm going to do with this is I'm going to pick a section of, of feather that's about gap of the hook in, in width. And I'm going to Stroke the other fibers back to create this V shape like so. Then I'm going to get in here with my scissors. So now I have two, two bits of turkey flat that are in effect uh, about gap width. I'm going to get in this in here and I'm going to snip this thing right where the V ends. I'm going to take this, uh, this little piece of segment I've taken. I'm going to lay it on top of my second finger and I'm going to fold it over my finger and grab the tips together like that and hold them in my left hand. I'm going to measure them entire from the eye to the bend of the hook length. So I want a reasonably tall wing on these things. I'm gonna set that down over the hook and do a pinch wrap, a couple of pinch wraps to make sure it's set on top of the hook. Then I'm gonna lift 
the front of the feathers up and I'm going to wrap in front of them in order to stand the wing up. There we go. And I'm going to come in behind and I'm going to get a couple of good solid wraps. Make sure it's in place. Bring my feathers in and sink scissors in and lay them on the shank parallel to the hook shank. And I'm going to snip off the excess like that, holding the tag, the tag end up at an angle. And what that does is that creates a, a little bunch of tapered fibers that I'm going to now wrap down onto the hook shank, the, the excess. And you'll see these turkey flaps really compact nicely. So now I can come forward. And now next is the, is the posting step, because I'm going to put my post in before I do anything else. And I'm going to wrap around the turkey flats gently at first. If you pull really hard, these things will fold over. And get two or three really good wraps right at the base. It stiffens them up a bit. And they're going to go around the post. And I hold them a little bit with my left hand when I'm tightening. And I'm going to make that post reasonably high and bring my thread down to the base. Make sure he's, oh, that was not very well done. Let's try that again. And I'm going to wrap the last wrap is going to be down at the base of the post. I'm going to let it hang down the far side of the hook. That's going to keep the keep, keep the, the turkey flats pointing straight up right on top of the hook. Now we need the trailing shuck. And the trailing shuck is this stuff called Zelon. It's also known as Eslon or some other lawns. But what it really is, it's carpet fiber. It's, it's a trilobal yarn. If you were to look at it in cross section, it's got sort of a triangular shape. And the reason for that is that you want to use that type of yarn is because the trilobal shape causes it to diffract light really nicely, makes it quite shiny. Now this is a dark brown because I want the uh, trailing shuck to be darker than the, than the fly itself. And you can see it, it I, I didn't take the whole strand. I took just enough to get a bit of a, what would be the trailing shuck would be the insects uh, shuck when it's hatched that hangs out behind the hook. I'm just gonna trim it off really short here with square. And I'm gonna bring my thread to the back of where the, the wing is tied down. Gonna make a wrap there and slide it back so that it now is sort of melded with the waste part from the wing. And I'm gonna wrap that right back in tight wraps, touching wraps all the way back to the bend of the hook and then just slightly around the bend in order to make the trailing shut point downward. Because when this thing sits in the surface film, you want the trailing shuck to actually point down below the film. Okay, I'm just going to make sure that that's nice and smooth and the thread covers the shank. I'm going to let my thread hang there. I'm going to come and I'm going to cut the trailing shuck about shank length, maybe a little longer than that. Now the body on this thing is actually a tur turkey biop. <laughs> now these turkey feather, sorry, goose biop. These are these are primary flight feathers on a goose, and we're going to use the biots which come off of the leading edge of these flight feathers. And on 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 these these big big ones, you can get a really long biot. You can see how long that sucker is. Some of the other ones you buy as stripped ones already, uh, they are quite short. Now you pull the biot off the stem. You don't 
uh, cut it off. And the reason for that is this, there's a little indicator on the biot here. I don't know if you can see that. On the, on the biot, you'll see that there's a little notch right here where that you've pulled it off. And you also see that the biot is almost transparent on one side and colored on the other. And if you put this onto the hook the correct way, when you wrap this thing forward, you want the transparent portion to face backwards when you're wrapping this thing. So you want this little notch, you want when you tie it onto the hook, you want this little notch to be facing backwards and down. So now I'm gonna take the tip of this thing and I'm gonna tie it in at the bend. And I'm gonna wrap right back to where the trailing chuck is. And now you'll see that that transparent part is facing down and the notch is facing down. I'm gonna bring my thread forward again in nice tight wraps right up to just behind the wing. Now I take my hackle pliers, grab the biot, and I'm going to wrap this down. So now when I wrap that slightly transparent part of the, of the biot is facing backwards. And I'm gonna overlap it, not overlap it. I'm gonna make the back edge of that biot just touch the leading edge as it wraps up the hook. And the reason for doing all of this, being particular about how you do that, is that if you wrap it the other way, you don't get this little ridge that sticks up. So you see, with by wrapping it this way, we've got this little ridge that sticks up. And that's what gives it the, the segmented appearance of the body. When I get right behind the wing, I'm going to wrap, cinch that down. And a couple in front. So if you were to invert that, you would get a smooth body, whereas by having it the way I'm putting it on there now with the transparent part to the back and then leaving the gap, you get this nice ribbed body. And you can chain, because on, on these types of light colored feathers, the trailing edges is, is almost transparent. You could alter the color of the body by using what kind of thread you use underneath. So it gives you some versatility. Okay, now the next thing is we need to put some thorax in. And I'm using a very fine Antron style dubbing. It's called Light Cahill Frogs here. I just happen to have what I what I want is a, is a nice, not spiky, but smooth fat, fat, uh, smooth dubbing that will compact down nice. And I'm going to spin it onto the thread. Again, not using too much at any one time. And I'm going to build a little bit of a thorax around the wing. And I don't need a whole lot of bulk. I want the thorax to be maybe twice as thick as the body. I'm gonna start with a few wraps behind then a few wraps in front. And then I'm gonna cross over from front to back, from back to front, and one more front to back, back, back to front. And I'm gonna do one more wrap right behind and let the thread hand on the, hang on the far side. Pull off the excess stubbing. Now here's the key is you want that Thread from now on, you want that to be on the far side of the hook. I'm gonna bring it up, I'm gonna make one wrap around the post and let it hang on the far side again. And this is where the hackle comes in. Now from this point on, the thread is no longer going to wrap 
around the shank of the hook. It's going to wrap around the post. And so what I do is I strip a few barbs off the hackle. I don't know how well you can see that. I've got a, a piece of stem sticking up. And I'm going to take this feather. And when I wrap this feather around the shank of the hook, I want the colored part of the feather, the, the slight cup to the feather to be facing down. I don't want the barbules to stick down. So I'm going to tie this thing in by putting the stem vertical parallel to the, the wing and with the bright side of the brightly colored side of the feather they're facing away from me. And then I'm going to go around the stem of the hackle and the wing at the same time. And I'm going to wrap that up the wing, up the post, till I got a good solid, and again, let the thread hang on the far side. I need to, I want to get that stem out of there. So I'm going to pull the wing aside and get that stem. And I'm going to slip my, slip my scissors in there and trim off the stem now. No, whoop, that didn't work. Let's try that again. <laughs> okay. Trick is to get that first wrap at the very base of the post snug. Okay, that's a short enough stem. I'm not going to bother trimming it out. Okay. Now, before I wrap this feather, I'm just going to take the stem and I'm going to pull it forward a bit. And then I'm going to start wrapping the stem. Whoa, come on. Stem around the post. And I'm going to make the first wrap as far up the post as I can. And then every subsequent wrap is going to be underneath the previous one so I always pull the feather down on the far side and the near side and make it up over the eye down on the near side up over the body down on the far side I'm going to keep doing that until I get a nice bushy hackle actually and then when I get to here I'm going to pull the feather and I finished wrapping enough hackle I'm going to pull the stem of the hackle down on the near side of the hook and I'm going to take my thread over top the body and down on the far side the same way I wrap the hackle. So I got to go over the eye of the hook and over the eye of the hook. But all the wraps of thread are underneath everything. And I'm going to come in here and I'm going to snip out the hackle from the bottom with my thread out of the way. At this point, I'm going to whip finish. And to do this conveniently, I'm going to grab the whole fly right by the thorax. And I'm going to turn it so that the shank is vertical in my face going to hang on to this bobbin so that it doesn't pull everything down out of the way. And I'm going to take my whip finisher. And this is a little different from one from what you've seen before. This is, this is like a Mattarelli, but it's actually a Marc Petitjean product. And what I do is I hook it there, put it in the hook there, and I'll slide it up to the parallel to the wing. And then I'm going to wrap underneath the feather, the, the hackle, right around the post, underneath the hackle. That's why I use a whip finisher for this rather than my hands, because it allows me to place that wrap accurately. And I push this little spring thing out of the way. There. And then I pull it up nice and snug. 
And I just, I don't snip, I just run my edge of the scissor up and pull against the scissor edge. And that's that. So there's your RS quad. Now you'll see that every one of these hackle fibers is now located on the top of the hook, away from the bottom. There's no fiber sticking down. What that does is that lets the fly sit right smack in the surface film and the trailing shut protrude, protrude below the surface film. And these fibers off the hackle are going to be like the legs dimpling the surface of the surface film. So that's Roman's fly. He caught lots of fish on the crow's nest using that particular pattern. And just to show you, you can tie them smaller. This is a size, that's a size 14 or 16, that's 16. So much for that. Now, the next pattern is also a parachute pattern, but it's more recent than what the RS quad is. And that's a, uh, this one is going to be a clink hammer. Now, for those of you who don't know, uh, this pattern was developed by a fellow by the name of Hans von Klinken. Hans is a, he used to work for the, the Dutch army as a, a special weapons, a weapons specialist. And uh, he had a lot of time to fish up in Norway and in Bosnia and places like that. And he developed this similar parachute style mayfly that rides most of the fly in the surface film and it sits again on those hackles. So it needs a post and a thorax. It's basically the same construction. Doesn't have the trailing shuck. And the reason it doesn't have the trailing shuck is that instead of using a regular dry fly hook, he's used a special hook he got the guys at Partridge initially to make, or he made it himself. Um, that's a special, clink hammer hook. This is a partridge one. And I'm going to show you the hook first. Now partridge are weird because their hooks, they say they're the same gauge as this says it's a 16, an 18, I'm sorry. But if you look at this 18 hook, it's way bigger than what we would call an 18. Now the gap actually might be an 18, but the overall shank length is more like a 14. So if you're gonna tie a size 14 or so, 14 or six, four, yeah, 14, call it a 14, you can use their partridge 18, size 18 hook. Their size 20, is, is a little smaller, but not substantially. Anyway, this, this 18 will do. The alternative to that is, and I'll get one out so you can see this. This is a size 12 Hanuk clean camera hook. And the shape of the hook is quite a bit different. You'll see that the Hanna cook has a, a, certainly this has a size 12 gap, but the hook shank is really short. It's like this partridge size 18, and it's got a very pronounced bend to it, much more pronounced than the, uh, than the other one. So I'm just gonna set that back and I'll show you eventually what the finished flies look like. The, the way I work it is that if you wanna tie a, a, a fly that is a, a physical fly is a size eight, 16, 
you can use a size 12 blink hammer, uh, Hannock hook. And a, a 14 would, would probably try a size 18. So make the fly two sizes or three sizes smaller than the hook when it's Hannock. But actually the, the ones that are, the, the partridge hooks that say they're 18s, they're actually bigger than that. The actual fly is bigger than that. So I put this crank camera hook in with this bent part of the shaft facing straight forward. And that's where the, uh, pardon me, that's where the, uh, the wing's gonna go. So once again, I'm gonna start the hook at the eye. I'm gonna wrap nice tight wraps of thread. And I'm gonna take it to where that kink in the bend in the hook is. And I'm gonna take it around the bend about halfway down the shank. I'm gonna come in here and I'm gonna trip that. And again, I'm gonna wrap the thread down the shank of the hook, touching turns all the way down to the bottom where the sharp bend starts, where, where the shank of the hook is being almost vertical in the vise now. And then I'm going to wrap back up. And the reason for doing this is that this is the color of the body that I'm going to put the, uh, the quill on. And it's a skinny body, but it's going to get fatter when I'm done. Now I'm going to take up to where that sharp bend is. And I'm just going to come a little bit in front of it, not halfway it down the bend, but a little bit in front of where the, the kink happens. And then the post for this fly is actually Antron. It's white Antron wing post material. I'm going to take a length of it and chop it off. I'm going to put that on the hook, halfway sticking in the front, halfway sticking out the back. And I'm going to do two wraps to hold it on the hook shank. And only two wraps at this point. Because <laughs> what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring these guys together and then post them up. And what that does is that reduces the bulk of material that's going to be uh, uh, behind the hook. So when I get them like that, I'm going to make a, a wrap around it as if I was going to start a post. Just a couple of wraps to kind of hold them in place. And because this, this isn't as robust a material as, as the turkey flats in terms of posting it up, it's a little trickier to, to get them together. All right, so now I, you see I've got double. I'm going to take my dubbing needle in here and I'm going to spread all this stuff out. Let's spread it all out, pull it apart. And the reason for that is I want to meld these two pieces together. So if I take this and spread the fibers out, see how but it spreads out as I do that. And then when I go to post it, all these fibers are gonna to meld together and it's not gonna look like a divided wing. So now I can hold all those fibers together and I'm gonna get right down here at the base of the post. And try to meld them together. And once more, I'm going to wrap here. And I want to make a reasonably solid post. So I'm going to hold it with my right hand and wrap up the post. Now, eventually, we're going to do the same trick with the, uh, with the hackle. As I get this post more solid, 
I may have to come in here and just divide these up some more with the dubbing needle. The idea is to try and, there we go. Try and make it, uh, make it one wing, not two. This is always the key with a, a parachute fly is to get a decent post and tall enough to wrap several wraps of hackle around that post. All right, once again, when I get to the top, I'm gonna make one final wrap down the bottom and then let that thread hang on the far side. So there's my post. And what I can do with this now is, because it, it's really tall, I can trim it down a bit. And I'm gonna trim it down to a manageable length. I can trim it some more later if I have to. Don't mind it being a little long. Okay. <clears throat> now what I'm gonna do is I'm going to take the material that I'm using for ribbing, which is this stuff, which is a stripped quill. So it's basically a hackle feather that has had the barbulous long hackle that probably a spay or slapping that's had the the barbules stripped off of them. And I buy, you buy them in a package of stringed material like that, strung material like that. And I'm gonna select one that's got a reasonably long quill out of there. So you can see it's just, there's your quill. Now, before you wrap this, you gotta wet it down. And I one, one of the things you could do is put a little skin softening hand cream on it. But I found if you just use a little saliva and get it nice and wet, it will be pliable enough to wrap without splitting. There you go. And right behind the wing, I'm going to snip off the last of these fibers with a little piece of quill sticking out. And I'm gonna bind that down onto the hook shank, right behind the wing. And I'm gonna wrap down or top of that body, again, in touching terms, all the way down the shank. This is to build up a little bit of bulk in the body and also to cover over the quill. And then when I get down to the bottom end, I'm just gonna put the quill on the far side a little bit. And I'm gonna wrap the thread back up the hook. Again, touching terms, covering over the quill. This of course, with this light colored tread will darken the body a bit. And then when I get right behind the wing, I'm going to take my thread and I'm going to make two little wraps right behind the eye, which I'm going to undo later. That's just to get the thread out of the way when I'm wrapping the quill. And I'm going to wrap, wrap this up the body, but not in touching turns. I'm going to separate them a little bit to give that segmentation that you want in the body of a mayfly. And as you can see, if you make nice tight little wraps, you get nice tight little rib that goes up the body. And one of the reasons you use quill is because it's light. And I'm gonna undo those last two wraps and then snug it down right behind the wing. Pull the quill backwards and wrap over in front a few times. And I'm gonna get in here with my scissors and slide them down the quill and snip it off. A little bit of a little piece of quill sticks out there, but that's not a problem because I'm gonna cover it up. Thorax on this guy is peacock.
curl and take a nice piece of peacock curl. Gonna wrap it around the thread, bring the thread up, cinch it to the hook shank, and then I'm gonna wrap the peacock curl around the thread. Five or six times. Grab it where it joins, and then I'm gonna wrap a couple of wraps behind, a couple of wraps in front, and then do the same thing as I did with the dubbing. One behind, I'm gonna let the, let the thread go. I'm gonna go one behind and behind, and then from behind to the front, and then front to the back, until I get a, a reasonably fat thorax. And once I get there, I'm going to wrap around and cinch the peacock curl down and trim the excess. The next step is the thread goes around the post again, at least once and let it hang. And again, I'm going to take my hackle and do the same thing that I did the last time, which is strip a few fibers off the end to expose the stem. Stick the stem up right parallel to the wing post. And I'm going to wrap around the stem. Oh, come on. I'm having trouble getting this to work. There we go. One, two, three, four, five. Nice and snug. That stem is short enough. I'm not going to worry about it. Trimming him. And again, hackle over the top, down on the far side. Over the top, down on the far side. So you're going to wrap over and under, over the eye, pull it down, over the body, pull it down. And that just forces each subsequent wrap underneath the previous one. And when I get to the last wrap, bring it down and pull that quill straight down and wrap my thread around the same way I did, down on the far side, over the eye, down. Your side. Get three or four good wraps. Then I got to push the thread out of the way with my fingers. Slide the scissors down the down the feather. And come on, snip them out. This is always the delicate part. There we go. And then once again, I'm gonna grab the whole fly. And this is always a little trickier with these bent hooks. I'm gonna turn it so that the post is horizontal, support the thread so it doesn't fall over. There you go. Take, now this time I'll use the Mattarelli, I think. Same, same issue. I want to wrap that whip finish underneath the hackle and around the post. I'll right, we'll go over the eye. I get three or four good wraps. I'm going to snug that in. The problem here is my hook is not as tough in my vise as it should be. Slide the scissor up and there we go. There's your link hammer. I got a few fibers that time that kind of stick down. So I'm gonna come in here and I'm going to trim them off flat on the bottom. There we go. So there's your clink hammer. A little mallard stick it down here. There we go. Same routine as with the Ars Quad. It sits flat in the surface film. 
and uh, the body hangs down below the surface film as an emerger. So there you go. Nicely tied for both of them, uh, Dave. Thank you. So those are those are all little tricks I've learned. We actually the clink hammer one. Uh, Hans actually visited Edmonton some years ago, and we got to learn from the originator himself how to tie the fly. Does there we go. It, does it make a difference? The uh, click hammer doesn't have that trailing shuck. Does a trailing shuck make much of a difference for you? I, I think, you know, the difference is that with the clink hammer, because the bend is so extreme in the hook that the body of the fly actually sticks below the surface film. Okay. Whereas with the, uh, the RS quad, the body of the fly will be in the surface film, but just the trailing shuck hangs down. I think it, these ones give a little bigger profile on the surface. So I, I've never done them head to head to see if one performs better than the other. They're both very effective. Flies be good when the trout are sucking the flies in and spitting them out. When, uh, if you have a real dry fly, they can spit it out before you can set the hook. But on those, they tend to suck them too far down their throat. Well, it, it's just because the hook is now protruding through the surface film. Uh, I think they catch more hook than they catch fly. <clears throat> but certainly, the clink hammer, I, I tie almost all my dry flies now I tie as parachutes uh, in one form or another. And some of them will have traditional straight back tails and some of them will have the trailing shocks and the bodies will be different materials. But I, I, I tie them pretty much all as parachutes because first off they land on the water better because that parachute, that wing that sticks up in the air causes the fly when it's floating down to land correctly. It doesn't land sideways, it lands vertically and it sits vertically on the water. The traditional cat skill, they don't, they can, they can kind of land almost any way, any orientation. So there you go. So Florin, you're up. Now you're gonna tie the, 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 the midges that uh, are not on the surface. <laughs> Yeah, just just one 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 comment on the on the clint hammer. Um, I might have shown you an emerger that's tied on a clink hammer hook that does have a, a tail. So effectively, what you do is on the back part of the hook you tie a pheasant tail nymph, so pheasant fiber and very fine wire ribbing to reinforce the pheasant. Then you do the top half of the is just like the cling hammer, so peacock thorax, wing post, and a hackle parachute style. And that fly works well too. Just you know, as 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 an idea. So you can and, and that's essentially an, an emerger, right? Half of it is is the, the nymph still underwater, and the other half is the fly emerging from it. Anyway, um what I'm showing you here is a selection of hooks that I'm tying these midges on. And these are the, the Tienko 2457 is kind of the reference hook here. So it's a heavier wire. It's labeled 2X heavy wire. The Daiichi is <clears throat> marketed as an equivalent to this Tienko 2457. I'm not sure which one was first to market. Now, the main difference between these hooks is the Daiichi, you might see this in the picture here, it's slightly offset. The hook itself is just a little, it's not all in the same plane. And then there's the Togan, uh, which is the 3X heavy, and it's visible actually even in this picture that is a significantly heavier, heavier wire. Shape-wise, the three hooks are pretty much the same thing. The togan is more of a continuous curve. You can see the eye of the hook is more in line with the rest of the hook. Um, I think they all work equally well. And if you tie them small enough, the biggest challenge is to actually take the hook out of the lip of the fish. 
Okay, I posted pictures of the finished flies, so you've seen those already. And now let's get tying some flies. Um, all right. So first one is going to be the zebra mage. So this is one of those uh, size 14 hooks. I can't really tell you which one this is. Probably the token, judging by the finish on the hook. So what I'm going to use for thread for this one is uni A to odd, favorite thread. I just start behind the bead. The bead is a 332nd black nickel finish bead. So it's flashy, but not excessively flashy. On a size 14, I can get by with uni French wire in medium size. The moment I step down to the next size down, I have to, I have to switch to fine thread, which it would be a, a small size on, on uni. Now, the thing is that with, with the wire sizes, if you're using UTC thread, um, a brassy size would, I believe, be finer than this wire I'm using here. So on a, on a, on a hook this size, uh, UTC brassy size works just fine, okay? And the reason to, again, start the wire at the front of the fly is so that you can get a smooth underbody Right, because there are only two steps to this fly. It's so easy. There is really not much to it. You want to spend that little extra time getting it nice. Okay, you can go a little bit in the bend of the hook if you want your midge to be a little, a little longer and have this curved shape. Or you can just stop earlier to get an even smaller midge tied on the same large size hook. Okay. And just bring your thread to the front and rib the fly with the wire. And you can see why this thing is called a zebra midge. Now to finish off the fly, so first I'm going to break the wire off and do couple of whip finishes with a black thread, okay? You could stop right here. This is a perfectly fishable fly. Or you can kick it up a notch and take some hot pink thread. This one is a Danville 70 denier. Um, on a large fly like this, you could probably get by with the uh, 140 denier from Danville, which comes in the same in the same color. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to produce a little hot spot here that will make this fly a lot more attractive and visible to fish. Whoops. And the downside of this Danville thread is that it does fray quite easily, which is very frustrating. And that's why I think I should have been using the, uh, okay, uh, where's my thread? I have too many flies on the desk by now. And so things are starting to hide. This one is hiding underneath the document camera. Okay, so I'm going to thread this back. Like I said, that's the one downside of using this thread. It's a little, it's a little too delicate for my taste. I find the I find the uni thread to be much better, but uni does not make any thread in this color. The closest they come to this is some kind of a pale pink. It's just not, it doesn't have this sort of blinding fluorescent sort of field. And if you, you can see here, um, I'm cutting this and I get 
I get stray, stray fibers almost floating in the air. So that's the that's the part I don't like at all about this thread. And so when you fish this fly, now the thing is, you might have seen in the in the pictures that my flies looked pretty dull, and it wasn't just not very good lighting that I was using, but it was the head cement I was using. And I found out that the, the head cement would, would, would darken this a, a fair bit. But the if I use the nail polish, that preserves color a fair bit better. So here's a reason to use nail polish instead of... Lauren, does the nail polish smell? Yes, of course it does. It's not the most pleasant affair, but you know, the, um, the head cement that I have also smells uh, just as bad. So yeah, now that the, the good weather is, is back with us, you know, you could just do this outside actually. Last night I had a bunch of these um, already tied and I set out on the porch and simply um, varnish them, okay? So this is the uh, finished zebra image and there is a little stub of thread there that I'm not gonna worry about right now. Okay, so that's the zebra image. Now, the other one that I wanted to show you is what's known as a mountain midge. And I asked around a little bit for, P, uh, for some, some history on this, on this thing. It seems to have been a, a fly that some people say originated in the crow's nest area. Um, it seems to be of an, a little bit of an Alberta fly, although I'm not 100% sure. Um, here, the ingredient, the main ingredient is red thread, which is going to be the underbody. And the rib, instead of wire, is going to be a strand of crystal flash. And this one is, I'm experimenting with different colors, but the fact is all crystal flash has this greenish shine to it when hit by light at a certain angle. And you're going to get that effect almost no matter what, what color you're using. Okay, so this is some kind of a purplish, pinkish sort of flavor of, of crystal flash. You can use the standard uh, plain vanilla, pearl variety. You can use um, just about anything that's, that's flashy um, at your disposal. And the difference is going to be some of these flashy materials are going to give you a bit more of a subdued flash and some of them are going to be really sparkly. So it's, it's really a question of experimenting and finding what works for you. I had good luck with just regular pearl crystal flash and I'm just experimenting with different varieties a little bit. And then just like with the zebra midge, you rib the body and try to do even turns, if at all possible. It's a bit of a challenge around the bend. And then secure it at the head of the fly here. Now for the head of the fly, this is a little bit more involved than the previous one. I'm going to use a little bit of pearl mylar. And this is saltwater flashable, which is a little bit wider, which works on a fly this size. If I go a size down, I would want to use some kind of, Uni I think makes um, spooled mylar in pearl. So this, this type of you know transparent stuff that's only sparkling at certain angles. Um, 
And I think that would be a suitable, uh, suitable material. Okay, so place this on top of the hook and I just cut a little notch there at the end. So the bit of a triangular shape that makes attaching this a little bit easier and gets rid of some of the bulk issues with wider material like this. So you want to build this little head on the fly, but you don't want to add ridiculous amounts of bulk. The next item is a little piece of peacock curl. And this is the place where you use all those kind of skinny good for nothing pieces of peacock that I'm sure you have kicking around somewhere. Okay? You don't want it too big and bushy because it just way out of proportion with the rest of the fly. So here I'm using this skinnier peacock curl and just attach it at the front and maybe get the bobbin a little bit out of the way and then build a little bit of a head slash thorax here. Three, four wraps is plenty. Okay. Secure this with a couple of turns of thread. Cut and then fold the mylar over the top. And again, whoops, secure with a couple of turns. Uh, if you want to be super safe with a mylar, fold back one more time. Do another couple of turns right at the eye of the hook prior to cutting the mylar. This pretty much guarantees your mylar is gonna be nicely locked in and you're not going to have any unpleasant surprises with it, okay? So now you, like I said, you can only see this mylar from the right, from a right angle. So I'm going to, once I take the fly out of the vise, you'll be able to see the, the sparkle right there on top of the peacock. And then just do one, always do two whip finishes for safety. You know that sinking moment when you look at your fly and you see that the thread is starting to unravel. Well, I can keep on fishing because it's, I know it's only the first whip finish that's unraveling on me. And by the time the second whip finish begins unraveling, the fly is disintegrating anyway, so it doesn't matter anymore. Okay, so this is what this guy looks like. And I'm going to, um, on this fly, it's, it's a matter of choice a little bit, whether you want to put any coating of anything on it. So I'm just going to use one of these clips to show you the, the fly from the top properly. Okay. As you can see here, this is that, that mylar. You can almost go a little bit narrower on this size and this is already a big size 14. Okay. And this again, you can, you can coat the, the crystal flash with a little bit of hardest nails that will give you um, a bit more protection. Usually this stuff is, is, is pretty tough. I don't find that the fish break that rib too easily. So you have to catch a fair number of fish before um, this starts to fall apart. Laura, do you, t do you tie this uh, with a bead head ever? Uh, yes, I do. Um, what are we doing on time? We're almost out of time here. Um, here are some bead head versions. Um, actually, I'm just going to show them to you rather than tying. Um, so uh, let's see. What do I have here? So here's a mountain midge with a glass bead. So I skipped that that mylar 
and I just put a glass bead all the way at the head of the fly. Um, here is another one. This is a zebra midge where I put, it's only visible if the light falls the right way. I put a little bit of a, like a little stubby wing of crystal flash behind the wing. May be able to see that against the right yep. background. See? Yeah. Um, then I, I have a, another version here that's um, a red thread, copper wire, and this is just the regular, I believe. I don't even think it's glass. I think it's a plastic bead from a craft store from ages ago. And a little bit of crystal flash again here at the at the back of the bead for a, for a little wing. Um, what other variations do I have? Um, those are kind of the main main variations. I've also tried a few specimens with a different. I think I was using some uh, flashaboo that you know, that UV pearl flashable, and that v gives a very kind of a subdued segmenting effect. So if you don't want to blind your fish with a shine, you can use that. You, you can see those ones that have a bit of a bluish, bluish tinge on them. Um, yeah, these are the main, these are the main variations. And I have some with glass beads here at this other end. And these are the, tied all the way down to size 16. And you can go down to size um, 18 as well. Um, size 20 starts to be a really super tiny hook. So those are probably of a more limited use. Yeah, these are the ones. And the, the last one I showed you was tied on, I'm experimenting. I, just got these hooks not too long ago. This is a Togan buzzer hook. And you can see by the shape of it that if you don't like those big cling hammer hooks, they're very, mm -hmm. very big and you wanna tie super tiny cling hammer style things, I think this would work well. It's a little bit of a heavier wire too. So you can see it's got a top part here that's straight and then it has a really sharp bend down so I think that those would, would work for those but all I've done so far is I've tried to tie some of this Kiranum it's like this and if you're wondering what what hook this was this is this is what this was okay and that's uh that's it and you can tie you know two dozen in a sitting without breaking a sweat.